On YouTube, there are plenty of tutorials for EU4, but most of them are horribly outdated and worse, boring. So in this guide, I'll do things a bit differently. I won't spend half an hour explaining what those windows do because after 5 minutes, you'll all zone out. Yep, I'll base this guide on a sample gameplay where I'll discuss all the basics, though some translations will be necessary. You can find the table of contents in the description and pinned comment. Hi, I'm Lucas, I play a lot of EU4, so I know a thing or two about this game. I also have a lot of EU4 content on my main channel. EU4 is a real-time strategy game, but on a massive scale, because you can literally play as any of those countries, even the tiniest tribe in America. And the goal of your gameplay can basically be anything. To enjoy the game, it's worth having most of the DLCs. The game without them is painfully bare. If you only have the base version, I recommend getting a subscription to see if the game is for you. Unfortunately, if you have the version on the Epic Store, there's currently no subscription available there. I've prepared a list for you, which will guide you on the order to acquire DLCs. Red ones are a must-have, green ones are also necessary, but can wait. Those marked in yellow focus on introducing various EU mechanics for specific regions or countries. Before buying, I suggest check Checking what each DLC adds and whether you think it'll be useful in your gameplay. When it comes to the language version of the game, by default it is not set from the game level, but from the launcher level when you enter the game settings and you have language versions here, but they are very limited. Fortunately, there are unofficial translations into various languages in the workshop, for example, Polish version. What is important is the date of the last update and checking whether there was any patch after it. Then you subscribe, wait for it to be downloaded, and then create a new set. PL, search for mods in the set, add the Polish version you are interested in, add it to the set, and select the set that contains the mod for the Polish language version. You got it. EU4 in Polish and the Polish version is quite okay. You have to check other languages yourself. However, I'll still continue recording in English because I learned this game in English and this guide will also be in English. To start, I advise you to go through the tutorial. I even went through it and it teaches such basic basics as moving units. Then you move on to a normal gameplay lobby. Here, two elements are really important for you. In the top left corner, choose the starting date of the gameplay. Initially, you're interested only in the 14 Tium 44 date. Then at the bottom, Paradox has prepared a list of recommended countries. The first three are considered good for beginners. Unfortunately, that's not entirely true, except maybe for Portugal. Personally, for your first gameplay, I'd recommend England, France or Poland. For the purposes of this guide, I chose England, because if everything goes wrong, you can always isolate yourself on the island. If it's your first gameplay, I'd use standard settings and definitely wouldn't make it easier for myself, because you might not notice how some basic mechanics work. The quicker you figure them out, the sooner you'll conquer the world. You can set the gameplay mode in two modes, Normal or Iron Man. Iron Man is a mode where you have one save file that keeps getting overwritten and only in this mode can you achieve achievements. For the first game, it's better to choose Normal. And I advise against posting screenshots of your approaches on Normal, because everyone will think you cheated. Initially, you'll see a window with the historical background of the chosen country. This window really sets the mood for the gameplay, making it easier to understand what challenges the country will face in the near future. In the case of England, it'll be the impending war with France and a certain political crisis. In EU4, you're not just the ruler of a country, you are the country itself, and each country is made up of at least one province. It's in these provinces where all the magic of building, taxing and moving units happens. Provinces are then defined by lots of statistics, most of which you won't even think about most of the time. You'll mainly focus on the bar at the top, which gives you an overview of all your provinces, like treasury, green for income, red for expenses, on a monthly basis. Manpower, representing the manpower you can convert into additional troops, or replenish losses in your current army. Sailors, same concept, but for your navy. Stability, indicating the societal peace in your country, with values ranging from 0 to 3, preferring 1. Corruption, initially not a big concern, the less the better. Most experienced players tend to max it out through economic settings and forget about it. Prestige, providing various benefits acquired mainly through battles and random events. Ruler legitimacy, determining your right to rule the country. The higher the better. Aim for above 50. Power projection, explained in tooltips, which are those little info windows. Most detailed information, as mentioned earlier, can be found here, but I'll elaborate further during gameplay. Now let's talk about something special, the missions of your country. Mission trees roughly outline the direction your country can take, but only to a certain extent. Most countries have unique mission trees, which can also influence how AI nations interact with you. For example, the French mission tree tends to lead to war with England. 
Uh, a question mark on a mission informs you of the requirements, while a medal indicates the reward. That's the basics covered. It's good to pause at the beginning of the game because there's a lot to do. First, we'll designate rivals on the international stage. Countries of comparable power who aren't particularly fond of each other and may even oppose each other, at least for now. Similar to the current situation with China and the USA. Click the red flag. Currently, Scotland, Denmark and Burgundy aren't on good terms with us. Oddly, France isn't listed. Generally, you want to choose rivals you plan to engage in warfare with soon. Avoid stronger countries like Castile or the Ottoman Empire. Sometimes you might end up with a former ally as your rival. I've chosen Scotland as a rival because it's an easy target for conquest. France doesn't see us as a rival, but they still hate us, as indicated by the fire symbol and minus 200 next to the shield. Additionally, Castile views France as a rival, making it easier for us to form an alliance. It's worth paying attention to these dynamics. Lastly, I've selected Denmark as it's the weakest and won't pose much of a threat. Rivalry grants us certain bonuses, such as increased prestige when engaging in battles with the designated rivals. Now let's move on to forming alliances. The easiest way to see which countries want to ally with us is by clicking here on the production interface. Yes, production and alliances might not seem related, but this is the panel for quick actions. Currently, I'm interested in diplomacy, so I'll click on the flag for alliances and see which countries are interested in allying with us. If you scroll down, you can also see how close you are to forming an alliance with a particular country. As I mentioned, we're interested in allying with Castile, so I will pursue that. Simply click on a country, and our diplomat will set off on a journey, returning in 12 days. However, the alliance is formed immediately. To form another alliance, we must wait at least one day. I formed an alliance with Austria next, but I'll do it a bit differently. Click on the country, then diplomacy, then alliance action, and finally alliance. For England, the best allies initially are just France's rivals as they're likely to assist us in a war against France. So, I've allied with Aragon, but note that it affects our alliance with Castile because Aragon and Castile consider each other rivals. When seeking allies, it's useful to consult the ledger, click on the military tab, one page further, and you'll see the army sizes of all countries worldwide. Bigger armies make for better allies. Next, let's talk about Parliament. It's unique to a few countries because it depends on the form of government, such as in England. To check what form of government we have in England, we go to the Government tab and then Government reforms. We have an English monarchy. For instance, Poland also starts with a parliament. In parliament, you can conduct debates. Some offer cool bonuses, but most don't. You'll get the hang of it over time. Until you start a debate, reforms change monthly. Members of parliament represent specific provinces. As indicated, when you enter a province, you'll see a chair there. See it? That's a representative in parliament. York already has the option to assign a new seat to parliament. You can leave it on automatic, the game handles it quite well, or you can add seats yourself, as it provides really cool bonuses for the respective province. Initially, it's worth adding provinces with trade bonuses. To check that, go to economic maps and trade maps. Look for, oh, that square or that one or that one. Let's take an example of a debate. It's quite all right. It's good to have cheaper advisors. Now, the debate process begins. Initial support is always random, and you must persuade representatives of specific provinces to support your cause. This comes at a certain cost, though. Generally, avoid autonomy and crown land. The worst thing that can happen is dismissing an advisor, too. The rest is usually acceptable. When you reach 100% support, the law takes effect and lasts for 10 years. After those 10 years, the process simply repeats. Next, your advisors. Because initially, you don't have any. First, an administrative advisor. It's worth checking which advisors we have and how much they cost. England starts with a guaranteed advisor, who's half price. I'll hire him. Additionally, a advisor for social unrest is always a good choice. Then, a diplomatic advisor, also guaranteed to be cheaper. Having diplomatic reputation is very useful. Here, a trade advisor or a relations booster might be useful. Diplomatic reputation makes it easier to form various international relations, like alliances. Next, a military advisor. No cheaper option here. But I know England is a wealthy country, so I'll hire a level 2 advisor here, preferably one with discipline or morale bonus. We have advisors, but why do we need them? Apart from granting us these bonuses they have, advisors are one of the two main sources providing us with monarchy points. Monarchy points include administrative, diplomatic, and military points. Hover over these points for more information. Everything regarding how you obtain and spend the monthly is listed here. Monarchy points are crucial, and you'll spend them on various things. I'll talk more about this later. The second source of such points is our ruler. In the case of England, we have a very 
very weak ruler because we don't get any points from them. The maximum possible value of ruler points is 6, 6, 6 and for advisors it's 5, 5, 5. You increase the level of advisors with money by clicking on the star. Currently I don't have money so I can't do that. Increasing the level of course increases the monthly salary of the advisor. Unfortunately we can't upgrade rulers like that. Once every 20 years we can change our court's focus in some aspect. I'll focus on military actions for now. And here I lost a point, here I lost a point, but here I gained two. Another tab, super complicated stuff, won't bore you with the details. I have got a separate guide for personal unions and inheritance, old but gold. I've even added some English subtitles to it now. Ha ha ha, let's see some land. That means we're delving into estates now. How do I explain this understandably? Estates reflect the social structure of your country. Clergy, nobility, burghers, and their percentage share in land distribution. Part of this land belongs to you, part to the estates. You'll see it on the chart. Estates are determined by their loyalty to you and their influence in the state. To learn more, read the tooltips. You can influence both of these factors in several ways. For instance, actions related to crown land, starting privileges, typically negative in nature, or granting specific privileges. Granting a privilege that increases our administrative monarchy points by one will cause the crown to lose 10% of the land. Clerical influence won't increase, but their loyalty will drop. But as you can see, loyalty didn't immediately drop by 5% because it reduced our equilibrium, something their loyalty will strive towards monthly. Aim to keep it above 50%. Understand now the remaining privileges for points, they're just worth having from the get-go. You should notice that you've lost all crown land, weakening your authority and incurring the following penalties. You can reclaim crown land using methods well described in the tooltip. I'm seizing land while on pause, reducing the penalties. Land seizure occurs every five years. Except at the start of the game, you don't want to have less than 1550 land. Generally, you'll aim for 25% and you'll see why later. Now, I'll distribute the remaining standard privileges. It's wise to assign cheaper advisors in each estate. Then there are these individual privileges, like for the clergy, religious diplomats, for the nobility, supremacy over the crown, for the burghers, increased prestige in initially might be useful, as well as taxing the burghers. And this privilege specifically gives us in national decisions where we have the opportunity to get cheaper buildings. Unfortunately, burger support decreases. For now, I don't need it. Because I'm broke anyway. You can revoke privileges too. You'll find more information about that in the tooltip. For most privileges, you'll simply need higher loyalty than the influence of the given estate. When the loyalty of an estate falls below 30%, it starts giving you negatives. The larger the influence of the estate, the greater the negatives. Above 30% loyalty, an estate will start giving you bonuses. The higher the loyalty and influence, the greater the bonuses. Another thing is completing missions for specific estates. We can do this every five years and it's worth doing. Positive effects here last for 20 years. And usually you want to complete a mission that either gives you money or gives you the opportunity to have a cheaper advisor. For example, this mission gives me the opportunity for a cheaper diplomatic advisor, so I want to do it. Although I have to admit, this mission can be very difficult to accomplish for most countries, but not for England. The last thing I want to do before unpausing the game is to send our trade fleet, which consists of light ships on one of the missions, specifically to patrol trade routes in the North Sea because we've taken that mission before. Trading is quite complicated, but I'll try to explain it in a few simple words. A trade region consists of several provinces, which you can see exactly like this. Here we have the English Channel, and here we have the North Sea. There are many trade regions. As you can see, I instinctively click on maps because because you have the option to set up maps you use most frequently for quick selection and even assign them to specific hotkeys. But back to trading, as the ruler of England, the English Channel is the most important for you because it's the main hub of your trade and money flows into your treasury from here. But not all of it, only 40% of it. And that's your trade power in that trade node. You can increase it mainly by building trade buildings. It's worth doing in provinces that only have these squares called trade centers. Next, you can expand trade centers for more more information in the tooltip, you can also issue special trade edicts. The last thing is to send ships to protect trade, although ships are least effective at the beginning of the game. Then we have the amount of cash in a given trade node. This consists of local, which is money from provinces, belonging to that trade area. You can increase this by building a special building called manufactories, the first one from the left. Production buildings, however, don't increase this value. Another way is to develop provinces for diplomatic points. Incoming is the value of money sent from all those areas around. You 
increase this by increasing your trade power in specific regions. Outgoing is the value that escapes from that trade area. But the English Channel is a special area that doesn't have this, but other areas do, like the North Sea. Here, outgoing consists of these two amounts, and your trade power also affects this. There are also merchants. Initially, you have two of them. It's best to send merchants to areas from which you can transfer trade to your main trade area, because then you do it better. They can also collect money from trade, but it's usually not worth it. This big complicated window pops up when you click on a specific trade node. Here are all the detailed information, but I think what I've told you so far should be enough to get you started. Alright, I hope your brains are still holding up. Now onto the Warfleet, just gonna breeze through this. For now, Mothball in a funk, anchoring in port, more in the tooltip. You can wage wars as England right from the start, but I don't recommend it because you'll need about 5 years to stabilize the country internally. So first we go into the economic tab and lower army maintenance. Then we go into the military tab and turn off fortress maintenance. And basically, you should do this every time you're not at war until you have a robust economy. As for our forts, those located on the continent, I just delete them at your place. We don't need them there. Another important matter concerns the province of Maine and the conflict with France. If you unpause the game now, within a few years, you'd get the surrender of Maine event. In EU4, events basically fall into two categories. Historical, which always happen if the conditions are met. Surrender of Maine is an example of this. And random events, which are more common. These events usually cause something not always positive. Surrender of Maine as a historical event reflects what really happened in history. And as the player, you have a choice here. You can give Maine to France as happened in reality, but England lost face back then. Or you can tell the French how much you love them, but unfortunately, it will lead to war with France. And unfortunately, it's a war where England is the aggressor and France is defending. As a result, France can call all its allies to arms and we may not necessarily be able to. For a beginner, it's a very tough war. So let me show you a way to prevent this event. I lower the autonomy in Maine, also decrease the administrative development. It'll cost me a bit. By the way, autonomy is the worst economic modifier in this game. You want it as low as possible, preferably 0%. But back to the province. We can sell it, we just need my diplomats. Unpausing now. I won't sell Maine to France anymore because it made me rival, but I can sell this province of Provence. We click Provence, Diplomacy, Economic Actions, and here we have the sale of the province. We select Maine, scroll down, and look at the sum of money they'll pay me for this province. Take the money, and Maine becomes Provence's problem. Thanks to this, we can also complete the mission to end the Hundred Years' War, which will put us before the historic choice about the future of England. Whether we can follow the historical path of Great Britain or the Angevin Empire. Angevin is much harder, so I recommend going the way of Great Britain. This choice changes the mission. We've sorted most of the initial settings, and unfortunately, this is how the beginning of the game looks. Now things are going to get more interesting. On December 1st, you should notice another icon pop up. Incoming disaster. Like a snap, it'll take you to the stability and expansion panel. Here, you've got all the crises listed. They can be specific, like the War of the Roses for England, or standard for most countries. The tooltip explains the conditions needed to trigger the crisis. And below, you'll see its progress bar. Generally, crisis are bad news. But we do want the War of the Roses. It's a quick way to get rid of that lousy ruler. The yellow icon alerts you to low crown land ownership. As mentioned earlier, that's not good. In the tooltip, you'll see the penalties for this. The worst modifier is monthly autonomy change. You want to reduce it ASAP. That means you need more crown land. Along the way, you'll get some royal marriage proposals. Usually worth accepting, but not for England, not before the Civil War. They increase their chances, which you don't want because one condition for a Civil War or is no heir. The ruler's chances are slim due to his traits, but let's not push it. Still, we might want to improve relations with certain countries right from the start to strengthen our alliances. You aim for wow 200 points whenever possible. So, let's send improved relations to Aragon and Austria. Relations range from 200, they don't like us, to plus 200, they love us. Good relations with allies are crucial. Typically, to maintain an alliance, you need to be above zero. Your influence on relations is detailed in the tooltip, and more factors will be added there. We can also gather our army in one place to reorganize. You can consolidate your army into one large force, making it easier to manage. Initially, you want your army composition to match the battlefield width, which increases with military tech. After consolidation, we can start forming them. An army consists of regiments, infantry, cavalry, up to four units, always even, and artillery. 
First, I move all the infantry to the new army, then the cavalry. I'll delete the excess cavalry. For most countries, it's cost-effective to recruit only infantry at the start, as cavalry is too expensive. But England is wealthy, so I'll keep some cavalry. Unit strength is indicated by dots, and generally, the more the better. In peacetime, a general isn't necessary, but during war, they're vital. Without one, your armies are much weaker. Generals also have pips, just like units. Recruiting a new general costs 50 military points, but usually you don't want your rulers, especially those with good stats, leading your armies as they have a higher chance of dying prematurely. Yeah, making a weak ruler a general is a good way to get rid of them, but not for England, at least not this ruler. We want him to die in the Civil War. I got a random event. I'll reject the heir as they're weak. My diplomatic advisor died, so I need to hire a new one. This time, I'll pick a trade advisor as they usually pay for themselves. Note that I can't promote this advisor to a higher level because they're of unacceptable culture. Acceptable cultures can be seen in the government tab at the bottom. After accumulating some gold, I'll expand my trade fleet, but first I'll build a flagship, which provides bonuses to the fleet it sails with. Each country can have one default flagship and it'll have these three upgrades. Then I'll build trade ships up to my fleet limit, another unpleasant historical event for England, the so-called Lollard Heresy. We don't want increased autonomy for 20 years. As I said, it's the worst possible modifier, so I'll choose the second option. In January 48, since we're about to have a civil war, I recommend re-enabling army maintenance, naval maintenance, and forts. In a civil war, the choice is simple. Pick the better ruler. To end the war, just fulfill the conditions listed in the tooltip. You don't even need to improve stability. I'll move my army near the rebels, but won't attack immediately. I'll wait for them to regain full morale. More rebellions. In the meantime, my ships have been completed. I'll gather them in one place. If you press control, you will only select naval units. Then I'll send them all to protect trade. And there you go, ready to battle. Here, rebels in York, but I'll be the attacking army and there's a river. You can check the details by hoovering over the square. Crossing rivers penalizes the attacking army, but more on that later. See, they're moving. The tooltip tells you where. To this province, Northumberland. There's our fort. So as long as it's not captured by the rebels, we'll always be the defending army here. And our opponent, the attacking army. That's why they're attacking. I'll receive a a misleading hint about getting penalties, but actually it's the rebels who'll suffer them. Oh, there it is. And now, there are always two sides in battles, attackers above, defenders below, there are two phases within the battles, fire and shock, and so on until the end of the battle, and during these phases, the fire and shock statistics for generals, or fire and shock for units, are important. And morale pips affect these two morale bars that are here in the battle. Battles in EU4 are random, which is expressed by rolling a dice. Values from generals are then added, or values from terrain are subtracted, and this affects the losses incurred by both armies, and then these losses affect how quickly the morale of both armies decreases, to put it very simply, because in general it is extremely complicated. But for now, this is enough for you. I recommend watching more detailed military guides at Zlewik YouTube channel. In the very center are lines the width of the battlefield, and each regiment is represented here by this little square. That's why I have 20 of them, my opponent has 19. If we had artillery, it would be in the rear line, mostly because if they were in the first line, you would lose the battle. And finally, we have general army statistics, discipline, morale, tactics. In short, discipline affects the infliction of losses on the opponent in manpower. It also increases your tactics, and tactics affect you taking less damage in manpower. The morale stat determines your maximum morale. When it reaches zero, you lose, and the difference between the maximum morale values also affects the rate of morale decline. Yes, I know it's complicated. To put it simply, have larger armies with better stats than your opponent. And now I will deal with defeating subsequent rebel armies. Now I need to transport part of my army to the continent. We can do this in two ways, with control. And then your transport ships will automatically start carrying troops, if you have this checked for your transport ships. Or you can manually transport your army yourself. You need another transport ship for every thousand regiments. To help myself a bit, I decided to recruit mercenaries, because this is the second resource we can have. Here is a normal army. Army, here are mercenaries. There are many types and types of them. And basically, the mercenaries have the technology of the countries you recruit them from. If you click on it, you will find all the information in the tooltip here. Quite okay for me, there will be Swiss Guard. And I actually forgot to tell you something. My army fought a battle and suffered losses. And these losses are supplemented from the pool of manpower that we have. And we mainly increase this pool by building these buildings or this factory. Since two of my provinces are under rebel occupation, I sent two units 
units to retake them. A thousand troops are enough. In theory, to retake our province in Kale now, we could obtain a military passage from Burgundy. However, this is not possible because he is our rival. Since I don't control the port of Kale, my troops must land here. Something like a tiny D-Day. As for mercenaries, they have their own separate manpower pool. They don't use the main one right here. When it drops to zero, it will slowly regenerate, but it is better to disband the mercenaries then. Because in 10 years, they will recover 100%. It is worth using mercenaries, especially during the first 50 years of the game. Then over time, the further into the game we are, the more expensive they become. As a result of negative events, I will soon have a loan. And let me tell you honestly, instead of taking a normal loan, let's take advantage of the special privilege that gives me five very cheap loans. You can also use mercenaries to be the first in battle. See, they arrived on the battlefield a day earlier, that's why their units are in the first line and suffer the main losses. Then you can save your main manpower and the end of the civil war. Before doing so, however, it is worth taking the risk of stability, at least plus one. I use administration points for this and the lower the stability, the cheaper it is to raise it. That's why I make a plus two out of the event. I also managed to complete the mission to end the war. This is my new ruler. He is much better than the previous one because he gives us many more monarchy points of all kinds. After the rebellion, I reduced troop and fort maintenance again, and now I can prepare England for the first wars. I know France will be involved, so I'll send a diplomat to start building my spy network. Covert action build spy network. The spy network provides several bonuses, which you can see here. I mainly care for a faster fort acquisition. The next step for England usually involves war with Scotland or the conquest of Irish duchies. I'll start with Scotland. It'll be a war where I'll need allies because Scotland is defended by France. These two countries have formed an alliance, probably because they're both my rivals. Aragon will already be on my side, but I still need to convince Austria and Castile. To get Castile's support in the war, I need to have 10 favor points with them, which can be acquired automatically through alliances or expedited by a diplomat. I'm using curry favors, including with Austria. We gain favor points faster when we have a greater diplomatic reputation and military strength. Besides war, favor points can be spent on various other diplomatic actions, such as obtaining money or increasing a country's permanent trust level towards us, which ensures future support in military actions. A standard Tudor event has occurred. I won it. It's been five years, so in the estate interface, I seize land again. Since the burghers had less than 50 trust, a small revolt occurred. Soon after, I can develop technology. This icon reminds us of this. I develop military technology with military points. It's the only technology where falling behind isn't an option, and sometimes it's even beneficial to stay ahead because it provides consistent bonuses for the army and unlocks more advanced unit types. With War Looming, I activate army and fort maintenance and undertake the Rise and Army mission, which gives me Casus Belli to make Scotland my vassal. I also have territorial claims to all of Ireland, visible on the diplomatic map. To declare war now, I need to access diplomatic actions and declare war. Attacking a country without a Casus Belli would destabilize my country and alarm others. Therefore, I have numerous Casus Belli now, giving me reasons for war. I'll use subjugation for this war. If I fulfill the war goal and win, Scotland will become my vassal. Additionally, I'll call upon Aragon and Castile for war, but Austria won't support me due to their ruler's negative trait, cruel. The unnoticed Irish duchy opens new possibilities for me. War with France isn't cool. I mean, not for beginners, because I enjoy the pain. Instead of attacking Scotland, I'll go for the Kildare duchy. Their combined armies stand no chance against mine. If you check that box, it means you're also attacking Scotland, and then it will call France for help, and I don't want that. I attack. I'll divide my army in half and besiege the Scottish fortress. I'm gonna need my fleet, so I deselect this option. Sieging a fortress means that I need to use a minimum of 3,000 of my soldiers for each level of the fortress. If I don't do that, I won't make any progress in the siege. At the end of each cycle, there's a chance to randomly draw one of the things listed here. Initially, these will be bonuses for siege progress. The higher the progress, the greater the chance for a more favorable draw, including the fall of the fortress. Here are several modifiers affecting the base percentage chances. Initially, it's the commander's siege ability. Unfortunately, John Talbot has zero. Also, if you move the fleet here and it's large enough to achieve 100% coastal blockade, it will affect these chances. If the fleet has enough cannons, you can bombard the fortress, destroying its walls and then commence the assault. It's better to reinforce with more soldiers before the assault. However, maintaining such a large number of troops in enemy territory increases our attrition coefficient, meaning I lose over 4% of soldiers from 20,000 each month, which is bad. Assaulting is a viable option, but honestly, I don't recommend it to novice players, because while the fortress falls quickly, you also lose a lot of soldiers. After the fall of 
of the Scottish capital, I'll negotiate a separate peace with them. I have 78 war score points with Scotland, and now various war extensions require these war score points. Since Scotland isn't the main participant in the war, because remember, I didn't check that box, most actions here have doubled costs. Exceptions include international treaties and the option to break alliances. Where is France? Okay, France was attacked by Burgundy, Scotland had its capital occupied, so it didn't respond to France's call, thus their alliance ended. I could break the alliance with Scotland and France, making my next war with Scotland easier. But for now, I'll simply negotiate a white peace with them, taking nothing, as it grants the shortest peace period precisely five years. The more war score points I spend, the longer the peace period, up to a maximum of 15 years. I'll conclude the war with Sildare by annexing the province for myself and taking their money. A newly annexed province is called Uncord Territory. Uncord areas can be incorporated into your country, bringing them under your administration. Until you do this, they'll increase your overextension index, which has significant drawbacks. Don't exceed 100% overextension. Now, to incorporate the province, you click here and select Make Core, costing you administrative points. This process takes around three years by default. It changes Uncored territory into Cored territory, although in this case directly into a state, because the newly annexed province is part of a larger area. Initially, we already had a state in Pale, so Uncored territory transitions into a state, skipping the territorial phase, but it costs you twice as many administrative points. Overall, I'll conquer the remaining Irish provinces in the same manner, while also advancing diplomatic technology. I'll declare war on the duchy, specifying that I'm calling their ally likely one of the Irish countries. And I attack, and repeat, and repeat, numerous times, but you don't have to conquer Ireland all at once. Ireland conquered. Now, as you can see, I am coring all the provinces. I now have the opportunity to reform my country. These reforms have several levels, with each subsequent one requiring the previous one to be developed. In the age of discoveries, it's beneficial to focus on tax increases. You can check which age you're in here. You can enter here and see what ages you'll have next. However, taxes aren't as effective in later ages, so I'd change to either this or that reform. You carry out reforms when you accumulate a sufficient number of reform points, which you gather faster with lower average autonomy in your country. Conquered provinces also have increased unrest due to their separatist tendencies, so I've left the hired army here to suppress these rebellions. You can find information on separatism in these unrest details. It decreases over around 30 years, since my peace period with Scotland has ended, as indicated by the absence of a certain flag that would normally be here. Look, France has such a flag here, so I declare war on Scotland to make it my vassal. Finally, to prevent my army from suffering losses due to high attrition, I divided it into two smaller parts. I end the war with the Scottish allies separately, taking their money and war reparations. Because I used the Cassus Belli to make Scotland my vassal, I cannot conquer its provinces. But when I mark that they are already my vassal, I can take provinces from them, but it's not worth it. An additional positive aspect of ending this war is gaining a lot of prestige, while the negative is acquiring a large amount of aggressive expansion. Aggressive expansion is a special modifier that aims to counteract too rapid expansion and can lead to coalition formation. Coalitions are a special type of alliance aimed at destroying a specific state that has generated at least 50 aggressive expansion points with at least four countries. And these coalitions can be dangerous. So in this situation, check which countries have a chance to join a coalition against you. I could talk more about these, but it would require a separate guide. The unification of the British Isles is behind you. And now what? First, deal with Scotland and start improving relations with them, which are currently very bad for understandable reasons. In the Subjects tab, you'll also see that this vassal is very disloyal and has high independence desires. You have until the end of the peace period with the Scots to reduce their independence desires to below 50%. If you don't do this, the vassal won't pay you a monthly tribute. Worse, one of your rivals, such as France, may support their independence desires, leading to a war of independence. When you hover over the liberty desires, you'll see what affects them. Additionally, you can decrease them by interacting with the vassal, paying off their debt, or using prestige to reduce their desires. As a last resort, you can also develop the vassal's province. Speaking of developing provinces, I have a lot of points already, and I also need to introduce the Renaissance Institution. Institutions are a special mechanic simulating technological development worldwide. Each institution has 
specific conditions for its appearance, and once it emerges, you'll receive information about its location and benefits. Not having the current institution required for a given time period increases your technology costs, which accumulates, so it's generally advisable to introduce them as quickly as possible. Shaded provinces indicate that the Renaissance institution is slowly spreading in your country. You can check the progress and influencing factors by clicking on the province and examining the percentage progress and its determinants. You can expedite this process by implementing the appropriate edict, but not right now or developing provinces. Boosting each development point accelerates progress, and more developed provinces introduce the institution faster. Developing provinces involves raising each of these points separately, with all bonuses displayed in tooltip. First, you want to reduce this cost as much as possible. You can do this, for example, by developing infrastructure. However, be cautious and use this approach in the best provinces. For England, these are the provinces containing trade centers. Infrastructure increases the province management costs, which you can view here in the stability tab. Governing capacity and currently those negatives aren't visible, but they hurt. As a rule, you don't exceed it. Governing capacity increases later with technology ideas and buildings. Another thing is a special edict that specifically reduces the cost of province development. You can also extract 10% from the burgers if it's at 60-60% here. I can't fix that right now. I Additionally, these costs can also be reduced with appropriate ideas, but I'll talk about that in a moment. With these preparations, you can commence province development, focus primarily on diplomatic points for production and trade, military points for manpower, and administrative points only as a last resort as they mainly impact taxes, which do not scale well over time. When it comes to developing provinces, it's also worth paying attention to the goods they produce. The trade goods map serves to identify goods with higher prices. Cloth is considered one of the best as it reduces the development costs and has a good price. My goal is to introduce as many developments as possible in London using diplomatic points, so I dev to the maximum. Then I alternate between investing in military and diplomatic points until the institution is fully introduced or we achieve significant progress. While I introduce the institution in this province, it doesn't mean it's introduced nationwide, because when you go back to the institutions tab, we haven't introduced that institution in the country yet, so we need to spend money on it. I'll again opt for cheap loans from the burgers to introduce this institution here as quickly as possible, but it's not always worth doing. The institution will spread across all our provinces much faster now. Additionally, you can use the edict for further assistance. Let's briefly revisit Ireland. Now that I've cored all the provinces and they've become my territories, I'll convert them into states. This entails spending administrative points influenced by war exhaustion, which we should ideally reduce. The autonomy of provinces that become states will gradually decrease. Regarding autonomy, manually reducing it is recommended as it's just the worst modificator despite the social unrest it may cause. However, I prefer suppressing these rebellions over maintaining high autonomy. Proper utilization of crown land is crucial in building the economy as we can sell it to the states. It's best to sell when we exceed 25% as more land decreases its value. After selling, we should aim to quickly return to over 20% to avoid autonomy penalties. Other penalties are insignificant. Whatever remains can be used to initiate construction projects in the country. Remember, you can reduce construction costs in the National Decisions tab by utilizing the privilege you granted to the burgers. In England, I'd prioritize constructing trade buildings in every trade center initially. It's not worth doing so in provinces without this bonus. Then, I'd build churches in all provinces until they reach about the joint nine development level. As for production buildings, Buildings. Focus on goods other than fish, wool, grain, and wine, as these typically house structures that enhance manpower resources. Upon advancing to the fifth military technology level, we gain access to more advanced unit types as indicated by this flag. The process is quite straightforward. Navigate to the military tab and update unit types to the latest ones available. More pips equate to better units. Using outdated unit types would render our armies ineffective. Shortly after, you'll be able to introduce the fifth administrative of technology level, which is pivotal. The sixth level introduces production buildings and manufactories, by the way. However, the fifth level allows us to delve into the ideas tab at long last. Here, you'll find national ideas, unique bonuses for your nation achievable through gameplay and the development of overarching ideas you can select up to eight throughout the game. 
For England, I'd initially recommend focusing on country development, namely infrastructure and aristocratic ideas, which when combined, offer a compelling policy. You can enact policies in the National Decisions tab, provided you've developed two complete ideas. If colonization is your aim, opt for the ideas displayed on screen, prioritizing exploration first and foremost. These ideas feature colonists, crucial for colonizing the new world, and enable the recruitment of conquistadors and explorers, specialized command units, essential for exploring new territories and seas. Without them, exploration would be near impossible, unless you acquire this knowledge through other means. Of course, you can interchange these two sets of ideas or select entirely different ones to try something new. For England, nothing is set in stone. I believe I've covered most of the basics needed for enjoyable gameplay. Let me know how many times you made that face while watching this guide. After completing the England campaign, consider playing with other countries to see what unique features they offer. Subsequently, you can explore additional starting campaigns in different regions of the world, although I advise against the new world for now. On my channel, you'll find plenty of guides worth checking out. Alternatively, you can watch sample gameplay videos where you can emulate my strategies. From other creators, I recommend looking into Red Hawk's content. He features many unconventional campaigns and provides valuable insights, as well as a few other intriguing creators. I also suggest watching the episode on the Netherlands as it offers valuable insights into colonization and economic development, providing inspiration for your continued gameplay with England 